And now they are camped at that mountain. And God speaks through Moses and he says to Moses, Moses, I want you to tell my people, the ones that I have redeemed with a strong, strong right arm, I want you to tell them how they are to live in relationship with me. And Moses, we're going to talk on this mountain. And rather than a bush burning, the whole mountain is going to be consumed in a fire, in, in a cloud, in, in magnificence as God comes down to speak with Moses. And His people, the children of Israel, are going to see God on the mountain. Not in a physical form, but they are going to see the manifestation, the glory of God as He fills the mountaintop. God says to Moses, Moses, you speak to the people. You tell them, this is what I require. And all of the people shout, all that God has said, we will do. They commit themselves to enter into a covenant relationship with God. And God says, this is how you are to live. And He gives them ten words. Ten laws that they are to live by. These laws come from God Himself. The original laws were written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. And Moses receives those laws. And Moses hears those laws. And Moses understands those laws up on that mountaintop. The ten laws are very familiar to us. There are four laws that pertain to God. Four specific commands that God gives. Reminding the people of who He is and what He has done for them. The four laws are number one that they shall remember Him. They shall know His name. They shall not make unto themselves any image, any idol of God. Because God is a jealous God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you are to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You see, as we as men and women living on a lower story level, if we want to live and be able to relate to God in the upper story level, we need to put Him first in our life. The vertical relationship has to be established. It has to be firmly grounded. Nothing can come between myself or ourselves and God. Anything that stands between us and God interferes with our relationship. God is a jealous God. He wants to be first place in our lives. God says, I'm a jealous God. You worship me and me only. And the question that comes to us today is what is standing between us 
and God. Is there something that interferes in your relationship with God, in my relationship with God? Is there something that I would rather be doing that would take place, take a position between me and God? Is it a television set? Is it a book? Is it, a net, is it an internet on the computer world? Is it a desire that I have? Is it something else that takes precedence in my life before my relationship with God? If it is, then God says, this has to be destroyed. This has to be removed. God then says, okay, if you've got a right relationship with me, then you need to have a right relationship with your fellow people. This is how you are to live. You are to first of all honor your father and your mother. Paul says that is the first commandment with a promise. When we honor our fathers and mothers, our days will be long upon the earth. But we are to honor our parents. We are to care for them. We are to, to share with them. We are to, to do whatever is necessary to care for them. Not only are we to honor our parents, but we're also to live in a right relationship with the people around us. That relationship means that we are not to kill. We're not to commit adultery. We're not to steal. We're not to bear false witness. And we're not to cut. Things we are not to do. What's the flip side of that coin? You take a coin out of your pocket and you look at it, there's two sides to the coin. There's a head side and there's a tail side. When we deal with the Ten Commandments, there's a thou shalt not side. You realize? There's also a thou shalt side. When we live in relationship with other people around us, there are certain things that we ought not to be doing. We ought not to be killing. We ought not to be coveting. We ought not to be committing adultery. Okay? We ought not to be stealing or lying. Okay? But what's the other side of that? We are to what? Love. Jesus said, years later, you love God first, and then you love your neighbor as you love. You see, if we love and if we respect and if we look at those around us, we will seek to put them first before our own lives. All of the commands that are don'ts are selfishness, where we put ourselves in front of somebody else. And God wants us to do more than not doing certain things. He wants us to be the people that are reaching out in His name and touching others. Loving them, caring for them, helping them, providing for them, doing whatever is necessary to help them to know that God loves them through us. Most of us don't like laws, or at least some laws. Laws are there to be obeyed. But you know, when you disobey a law, you get in trouble. I talked to my daughter last week. She had her speedometer set at 80 in a 75 miles an hour zone. The policeman clocked her at 83. She got a ticket. 
And rules for many of us are made to be broken. This doesn't pertain to me. Oh, I can do this and I can go a little bit above the speed limit and nothing's going to happen. Or I can do a little bit more than discipline my children. I can take it a step further. Laws don't apply to me. But when we're dealing with God, God says from His upper level story, this is how I want you to live as my people. I want to have a relationship with you such that when you are right with me, you are at right with all of the world. You're at peace with the world. Your neighbors, you are at peace with them. Doesn't matter how bad they might be. Doesn't matter what they do. But you, if you're living right with me, you're going to be at peace with them. God said to his people, I want to have a relationship with you. And this is what the relationship is going to be about. We think of ten commandments. But there are actually 613 laws in the Old Testament. There are both the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. And each of the 613 Three other laws amplify one or other of the Ten Commandments. And we are to live with our people. We are to live in our world in a right relationship with God and in a right relationship with people. And God says, when you are doing that, my people, my children of Israel, I want to dwell with you. I need a place to stay among you. You are sitting here encamped at Mount Sinai. You are living in tents and temporary structures. And my people, I want to be in your midst. I want to live where you're living. I want to be where you're at. I want to to see the things that you see and to experience the things that you experience. I want to live among you. And in order for me to live among you, you must build for me a tabernacle also. A place for me to reside among you. You see, we're going back somewhat to Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden where God walked with them each evening. Now God is saying to His people, I want to have a presence amongst you so that you can see with your own eyes My presence. None of the other gods of the world that people worshipped wanted to have a presence a living presence among their people. Because there are no gods. But God says, I want you to build a tabernacle for me. Tonight, when we come back at 6, we're going to talk about that tabernacle and, and all of the things that were in it and, and how all of that represents uh, different things that, uh, as we think of it in the New Testament like but tonight as we look at that, but, but, but this tabernacle, there are 50 chapters in the Old Testament concerning the tabernacle. How it is to be built, what is to be made of, the people that are going to be serving in it, and all of this. There is, a, there is more about the tabernacle in the Old Testament than there is about creation. Creation takes place in two chapters. The construction of the tabernacle takes 50. It's important. God wants to live amongst His people. He needed a place 
to stay. Not really a place to stay, but he needed a place where the people could come into his presence, into his tent, into his tabernacle area, and there they could worship him. They could have a closer relationship with him. And so God designs a tabernacle. After that tabernacle is built, there at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses goes in and out and God's presence comes down and fills the tabernacle. God's presence is among His people. Today, God's presence is also among His people. Not in the same way it was in the Old Testament as we're looking at the tabernacle. But today, as God promised in the future, there was going to come a time when God would take up dwelling within man. We, today, are God's tabernacle. As the Holy Spirit dwells within us, God is dwelling within us, and we have close communion with the Father. We have a closer communion with God today as far as Christianity is concerned than the people of the Old Testament did. They had a place that they had to go to to meet God. We don't have to go to a place where we can meet God right here. We can talk to Him. We can share with Him. But God says to His people, I am creating, I am entering into a new covenant relationship with you, and this is how you are to live. These are the rules that you are to follow. This is how you are to live in a right relationship with me and with your fellow man. And the tabernacle is going to my, be my physical presence in your midst. And it was a cloud that came out of that tabernacle that, would, that sat above that tabernacle. During the day, it was a pillar of cloud. During the night, it was a pillar of fire so that the camp had a night. But God was among His people. And we will see as we, as we look next week and... Uh, at the, at the wanderings in, in the wilderness that every time God wanted His people to move, the cloud rose up and began to move. And everybody would pack up and go with God. God was in the midst. Six tribes went before the tabernacle and, and, and the and the priest carrying everything, and six tribes followed. God was always in the midst. Whenever they camped, they camped with three tribes on each of the four primary corner or sides of the tabernacle. So God was always in the middle of His people. Always visible. Always working with them. Always caring for them. And providing for them. And not only could God provide and care for His people, but He could also hear His people and what they were saying. While Moses is up on that mountain, God hears what the people are doing down below. Moses had been gone for 40 days and 40 nights, and all of a sudden the people say, Hey, where is God? Can you imagine that? Can you, can, can you imagine? People are camped out at Mount Sinai. There's fire. There's glory all around the all around Mount Sinai. Moses is up there, and it's evident that God is on Mount Sinai, and the people say, "Where's Moses? Where's God?" Let's make an idol. Let's make an image so that we can worship the gods that brought us out. 
I cannot imagine how some people can be so insensitive to God's presence and the mightiness of God that they say, where is God? He doesn't exist. In the stars, his handy works, I see. And I don't remember the rest of that song, but it just came to me. But, but you look at it. You look at, at the mountains. You look at the heavens. I go out each morning and I look up at the sky as I'm getting ready to go to work and there is Orion high above me. And Orion is kind of standing up right now, but when Jenny and I were dating, we were dating at KU and and we would sit on the front of uh, the front uh, steps of Douthat Scholarship Hall, which was where Jenny and I, uh, which was where Jenny was living when we first met. And we would sit and we would look. And I remember, however many years ago that was, looking up at Orion and the light. Well, Orion at that time was laying on the side <laughs> for where we were sitting at now. He's, he's, but every time I walk out. And I look up at Orion and I remember what Jenny and I talked about and, and what we did sitting there on the steps of, of, of the Douthat Scholarship Hall looking at Orion. Boy, you cannot, I don't know how anybody can look up and not recognize that there's a God among us. That God cares about us as a people. But even though God is in the midst of His people, so too God recognizes that there is a sin that separates us from Him. God recognizes that you and I are human beings. You and I have a will you and I can choose to obey God's laws or we can choose to disobey. We can choose to walk with Him or we can choose to walk apart from Him. And God knows that whenever we want to walk with Him, that when we as sinful people want to walk with a holy God, that we also have to be made holy because God in His holiness cannot stand man in His sinfulness. That the wrath of God will break out against a man who comes before Him with sin in his life. And so God said, Moses, my people, I want you to have a way that you, you and I can be in a relationship and have fellowship with each other. I am going to have you to bring sacrifices to me. And the sacrifices are going to be the animals that are innocent. They are going to be perfect, without blemish. And when you come before me, when you want to have fellowship with me, you are going to bring a sacrificial animal. animal. That animal's lifeblood is going to be shed, and his life is going to take the place of your life. The innocent is going to die for the guilty. And throughout the time that God and his people had a physical relationship in the Old Testament, there was this idea of sacrificing of the innocent for the guilty so that a relationship could be maintained between God and His people. We don't often think about that today. Because today, as we live life, we don't have to bring sacrificial animals before God and offer them in our stead so that forgiveness and relationship can be established with God. The 
in the Old Testament as the people brought sacrifices, and even in the New Testament up until the time of Jesus, as they brought sacrifices. There was a ritual that they went through to sacrifice that animal. It was something that caused them to stop and to think about what was happening. Because when they, choose, when they chose to bring a sacrifice to God, when they chose to, to seek to enter into a relationship or a renewed relationship or fellowship with God, they had to first of all go out into their fields. They had to walk among their flocks and they had to look for a lamb, a sheep, a goat, a bull. And when they found one, then they had to closely examine it to make sure that that bull or that sheep or, or that goat or, or the two turtle doves were perfect. That there was no flaw among them. Then they had to take that animal and they had to lead it to the place where the sacrifice was going to be taken. They had to walk with that animal. They had to, to, to go to the place where the sacrifice was going to occur. Then they had to lay their hands on the head of that animal as they came to the time of sacrifice. And they had to identify with that animal. They had to symbolically transfer their sin to that animal. They had to identify with that animal as that animal slowly died. Because there was a knife stuck into the throat of that animal. And the lifeblood slowly drained from that animal's life. The lifeblood was caught in a basin which was given to the priest, who then offered it on the altar. Then the worshiper had to cut up that, that animal. Part of it went to the priest, part of it was placed on the altar, and in some instances part of it was kept by the family that offered the sacrifice. You see how much an individual had to identify with the animal that was being sacrificed? Today we just come in and we put money in a plate. Okay? We don't think too much about sacrifices and offerings. But there was one final sacrifice. The book of Hebrews tells us that the sacrifice of the sheep and goats was not permanent. The sacrifice of the sheep and goats in order for a relationship to be reestablished between man and God, that there had to be something more than the death of a sheep or a goat or a bull. That it had to be a sacrifice of an individual, a perfect sacrifice. And that is what Jesus did for us. The sacrifice of sheep and goats was temporary. It brought about a temporary forgiveness of sin. But the sacrifice of Jesus years later brings about a perfect redemption. A perfect forgiveness. A forgiveness that lasts for all eternity because it was His blood that was shed on our behalf. We must always remember that as we deal and seek to have a relationship with God. When Jesus died and when He gave the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came to take up residence within our lives. And so as Isaiah prophesied, there was going to come a time when the old covenant would be passed away and a new covenant would be instituted. But right now we're still looking at that old covenant, but we have the assurance that that new covenant is present in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as we look at the story, we see that God always wants to have a relationship with His people. He wants to have a close relationship. He wants to be in our lives and part of our lives and sharing with us in our sorrows and in our sadnesses and in our joys and in our uh, happiness. God wants to be with us. And 
the only way that we can be with Him is because the lower story is brought to meet the upper story through the sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins that is brought about by sacrificial animals. God instituted a new covenant with His people at Mount Sinai. He carried forward the covenant that He made, created with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now He has made His covenant with a people that are to be a holy people, that are to walk with Him and talk with Him and live in accordance with His rules so that they can be a light to the world. That's His story. That's our story. Today in Jesus Christ, He wants us to be a light to the world. We're going to stand and we're going to sing hymn number 295, Here in the Heart of God. And as we prepare to stand, let us bow in prayer. Father, thank You for Your story. Thank You for Your caring for us. Thank You for Your desire to be with your people. The desire to walk with us and talk with us and share with us. And Father, help us as believers in Jesus. Help us as believers in your Son and in you. Help us to walk near to your heart. Near to the heart of God so that we might live for you. For it is in your Son's precious name we do.